I know many, many people, I know a lot of charge, I know lawyers, I'm a businessman. We're going to protect Christianity, and I can say that. Welcome everyone, this is a very special panel for us at DIG Festival. We are today, it's October, we are in Modena, Italy, during DIG Festival 2020. And this is a panel that we organize in collaboration with the Logan Symposium, which will take place uh, on the internet in, uh, in November. And DIG is really proud to have established this uh, partnership with the Logan Symposium. We are long-time friends with the Center for Investigative Journalism, but it is really an honor for us to be uh, involved in the program of the Logan Symposium uh, this year. Uh, my name is uh, Philippe Di Salvo. I'm an academic and a journalist from Italy, and I'm a member of the board of DIG and one of the organizers with, uh, of the festival. And um, here today we decided to offer to uh, the Logan Symposium Global Audience, uh, a panel about the state of the art of investigative reporting in Italy and offer an overview of what is going on in the field here in the country from different perspectives. Uh, but before starting, I'll leave it to Sasha Joel Achille, who will moderate this session. So this is really interesting for me because I left Italy 11 years ago and I've never actually worked here. So um, I don't know what the landscape of investigative journalism is in Italy. I was never brave enough to come back. So, <laughs> so um, I'd like to introduce our amazing panel. So to Tilianesi, who is a reporter and co-founder of the Investigative Reporting Project, which is very quite new. Um, Philippe Di Salvo, who uh, has introduced himself and specializes in the research between the relationship between journalism and hacking, which is quite interesting having watched XY Chelsea last yeah. night. And Alberto Nerazzini, who has a career of 25 years of working as an investigative journalist in Italy and is the, co the founder and director of Derso, which is a production company. So I guess I want to really start with um, kind of getting an understanding of what the culture of investigative journalism is in Italy. I was, I wouldn't say brave, but I, I think it was <laughs> crazy enough to uh, come back to Italy after having started in, in London. And um, I, but I was at a university in London, uh, I studied at City University and we had um, one of the courses we had was actually investigative reporting and I got really passionate about it and I told that actually, yes, Italy had a harsh landscape but a lot of good stories. So it was the place an investigative reporter wanted to, to be in. Um, and when I started those things uh, about 11 years ago, uh, we met with a few other um, uh, young people who had the same passions but, and we wanted to do this job, but there was really no um, good options, for, especially if you were young and inexperienced, uh, on how to do it. And, and, and by how to do it, I don't only mean how to actually investigate and do a story, but how you could support yourself, how could you, uh, you know, find the funding, mm -hmm. and also what we weren't thinking at the time is all the consequences you might get once you publish an investigation, so all the uh, low suits you get. Um, I mean, by now it's just something super normal for us, but the first times uh, police calls you and say, yeah, yeah, I mean, you've been sued, come and you. <laughs> oh my God, I need a lawyer. <laughs> so um, we really didn't know much, and um, to us, 
the old version of DIG that was a previous uh, festival, uh, yeah, about 10 years ago, is really like the, 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 the start because there was this very small award, like 2,000 euros, mm -hmm. that was supporting young uh, reporters who wanted to get some small financial support to do investigations. Mm -hmm. So like the dig pitch of today looks like huge in compared to that. But for us, it was really already really good because it gave us the chance. At the time, we pitched a story on waste trafficking between Italy and Romania. And that tiny amount of money got us to travel to Romania and do um, a documentary, which I mean, if I watch it today, I laugh. But <laughs> <laughs> it, it was a great chance because then with that documentary, we were invited at the Global Investigative Journalism Conference in Kiev. And that really later on became our family, I mean, our working family, because from then onwards, we became part of the Global Investigative Journalism Network. And we've always been, like, say, the Italian terminal to that. Like, DIG and ESP are actually the only two Italian entities that are part of this global um, family. And, um, but trying to answer your question, how is the, the landscape, I mean, we've always been way more connected to foreign media and foreign colleagues than to Italy, like still up to today that we are um, now running uh, an investigative media outlet, uh, we're more known abroad than in our own country. Um, and the reason for that is because although there is a culture of investigative reporting in our country, it's always mainly been with mainstream media and the space uh, apart from the funding, which is a disaster, but the space has been shrinking more and more, like less and less media outlets, uh, like Repubblica, Corriere, have been dedicating space to investigative reporting, a lot of it because of the consequences, you know, like you get sued a lot, or you get, they ask for, uh, for example, in Italy, you can ask for damages up to the amount of money you want. So obviously that can become a problem for a media outlet. Italy plays a role an amazing role in, in um, like in the media, starting from the Middle Ages. I mean, we invented journalism. The first journalists were were here, you know, like uh, Fra Salimbeni in Parma, not far away from uh, from from Modena. But then, if you ask me, what about the tradition of investigative journalism in Italy? I think is very weak, and we have uh, we we had great journalism in uh, in in the past decades. At the end of, uh, after the, the Second World War II, we, we had a great school of journalism, but it was not investigative. I, you know, I, I, when, I was, when I was young, I, I, I was dreaming about journalism, about investigative journalism, and I didn't want to work on television, and uh, I ended up with, uh, start working with Michele Santoro, who was considered a very important anchorman, who was given a lot of space to, to to investigative journalism, but it was not investigative journalism. It was a, we had a great tradition of uh, social investigative journalism, of social inquiries. We had great example of that. I mean, not only f from journalists, but I, you know, I think about Pierpaolo Pasolini with Comizi d'Amore. That was probably the highest example of uh, of, uh, of a social inquiry, mm -hmm. and. Shusha, the program where I, where I began my experience in uh, the public television, was very important, very strong, very structured, very popular program, but it was not investigative journalism. The editorial freedom here is not very, very strong. We have uh, we have a problem. You know, my my reference, I think, our reference should be a guy like I. F. Stone, and I. F. Stone, the great American journalist, was saying a lot of things, but he was saying all governments lie, for example. So you have to think as a journalist that the official version is always potentially a lie. Mm -hmm. This in Italy doesn't, doesn't work. Journalists in Italy still have a, a respect. They are really scared by, by you know, disappointing the the, the power, the power in charge. We invented journalism, but at the same time, I think we, we are missing the base of journalism. That's why I, I, left, I left a program like uh, Report, who's considered the, the, the most important program for investigative journalism. I don't think so, uh, for the same reason. 
and I'm I'm trying to work with a, with an, an independent press agency and production house to work with the you know to have them together with like just like Irpi in, in, with the, with the, with the other journalists around the world a collaboration is the is the key word collaboration is the key word now and think about you Sasha you you made a great documentary about covid from here in Mantova i mean your film <laughs> Cremona I'm sorry your film was was filmed here and not as a journalist, but as an Italian citizen, I, 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 I understood what was going on in Cremona thanks to your film, but you, your film was not produced here. That's another paradox that we, we were the, 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 the front line of COVID. The best documentaries came from outside. So that's, we have to think about that. Historically, and particularly in the past, uh, 20 to 30 years, Italian journalism has been really peculiar and, and, and really isolated from kind of uh, international practices and, and uh, things that are given for granted abroad. Uh, there is a lack of um, investigative reporting coming from daily newspapers, for instance. They do that from time to time, but it's not like, for instance, in the Anglo-Saxon world where it's given for granted. It is their own job. Italian journalists tend to be very weakly professionalized, which is a huge problem. We don't have major journalistic programs in Italian universities. We have J schools, of course, but the way Italians can follow to access the professions are really different. I mean, you can get access to journalism without getting any training at all which is not a problem per se, but it gets a problem when you need to uh, kind of work into a very specialized area. And I'll give you an example, for instance, data journalism, which is one of the most interesting forms of um, investigative reporting everywhere. And it's now an established reality for over a decade, I would say, since WikiLeaks in 2010, in the UK, in Germany, in France, and uh, in Scandinavia. Uh, in Italy, instead, it is still um, in the hands of a few very brave and courageous freelancers who usually work in very difficult working conditions with very low pay, which is also a, a, a big problem because sometimes European journalists are horrified to know how much a freelancer gets for publishing a story in Italy, uh, which is if you publish a story online on the internet, and I'm referring to also an investigation, you get, when you're lucky, 200 euros. If you work for months for an investigation and the outcome you get is 200 euros, it really gives you an idea of how difficult it is. And if I think, for instance, to the Financial Times in the UK, The Guardian, of course, or Süddeutsche Zeitung in Germany, Neue Zürcher Zeitung in Switzerland, they have data journalists in the newsrooms. No Italian daily has such a unit in their newsrooms. And they, of course, they buy data-driven reporting from these freelancers, but in the condition I just described. So there is a lack of continuous supply of data-driven stories. And uh, we saw this uh, with COVID, for instance. Um, only a few uh, of these freelancers were really working in actual data-driven reporting. Most of what we saw from daily newspapers and television was blah, blah, around uh, the office of figures. And here at DIG, we, we, we awarded one brave data journalist for the work he did, because uh, he found out that the official figures was telling like a very small percentage of what was really going on. And he is Isaiah Bernizzi. And so uh, this guy working in a very small newspaper really changed the narrative about the pandemic here in Italy. And his method was also then um, covered and adopted by the economists, for instance. Everything that happens abroad in international networks with the ICIJ or the Panama Papers investigation, those kinds of things have been done by organizations like IRPI, not by big newspapers. They, they, they have been involved somehow, yeah. but uh, the real push for that starts from, from grassroots projects, from very independent networks, etc. So you can see that all the innovative ways of doing uh, investigative reporting are not really 
uh, getting into the newsrooms. They, they come from outside. And there is an extraordinary work done by people like Cecilia, but it's really saddening to see how the mainstream level of journalism is not yet aligned with what is going on in the UK, in Germany, and in other comparable countries. I don't remember, honestly, and maybe I'm wrong, but it doesn't come to my mind any data-driven investigation published by a major Italian daily. If I look, for instance, at my field of expertise, which is information security in journalism, there is nothing in Italy. There is a total lack of awareness into mainstream newsrooms, into public broadcasters, they have no idea about security. And there is no major Italian media that operates a whistleblowing platform. So if a whistleblower wants to approach Corriere della Sera, Pubblica, or whoever, he or she, they have to go to single journalist who maybe, for his or her own initiatives, um, launch a PGP public key or a whistleblowing platform. So it's always left to personal initiative of those few journalists who really are up to date and know what's going on around the world. It gives me the idea of why it's so important to have platforms such as ERP. So can you tell me a bit more about, you know, you guys kind of uh, started working again during lockdown. What, what's your goal? In 2012, after the Kiev conference, uh, we, when we were there at Kiev conference, we figured out that, uh, I think we were like, four or five Italians. No Italian newsroom, like mainstream media, had sent somebody at the global conference, whereas all the rest of the people were sent there, like BBC, Al Jazeera, what have, what have you, New York Times. They were staff reporters, most of them. And then, yeah. of course, you had independent filmmakers, and uh, I mean, the, the Hamburg conference that we had been together with Alberto in November last year, it was, way more mixed also because it was closer in Europe, so you had a lot of different people coming over. But at the time, in, in 2011 in Kiev, it was really like, okay, we're the only Italians and we're not even staff reporters. So we really felt like it was an empty space that needed some type of action. So we thought, okay, let's get together and do a center for investigative mm -hmm. reporting. Um, and after, but basically in, the, in what were we, we were trying to, win some type of funding, mainly like journalism fund or like what have you, like small grants that will allow you, <laughs> yeah, of course, because there is no grants whatsoever. I mean, the ones that I quoted, I think DIG is literally the only option here uh, and it's for documentaries. So if you want to do an investigation that doesn't involve video, there is no options in ATD. So we were trying to win like the small grants from abroad and journalism fund that is a Brussels-based uh, fund. It was really like uh, the only, I mean, our hope for a lot of years. Um, and then the idea is, okay, either we get commission, like initially we were doing a lot of fixing for foreign media, uh, taking them around, I don't know, Sicily, Calabria, whatever. And obviously our name will never be, we will not be autos, but this thing slowly, slowly brought us to good things, first knowledge on certain territories, certain stories, and then context. So maybe one day you're just a fixer, but the year later you're doing a project with that TV in Sweden or whatever. So we thought, why don't we try and have our own voice? And we organized for a year, we worked to actually open this media, which is not gonna show you in a while, it's ILP Media. And the idea is that we were gonna have an online outlet, so it is a paper, like an online paper, yeah. but we only do investigations. We have news, um, comment, comment pieces, and then here we also got uh, videos and podcasts. Uh, and then we got this thing is uh, Archivi Criminales, like criminal archives. We try and like investigate either cold cases or we try and get back in history. We do have an, a whistleblowing platform that was never used a lot by citizens, but we got some really good stories. Again, I don't know if it will work. We're not trying to compete with the big media industry, because we can, I mean, it's, it's just uh, not possible with the amount of funding we have, and especially with we're very few people. Uh, but the idea is actually to collaborate with them. So what we're trying to do is like, for example, during COVID, a few of our stories were um, uh, published together with one of the mainstream media of Italy. So, you know, the idea is that maybe 
slowly, slowly, we can bring this culture in this country. Well, so that, that's another question is, do you feel like there, there, mainstream media could have the appetite for it? Yeah, I think for a long time they thought that this is not selling and this is not sexy, but I think that actually people are tired of the current affairs, yeah. political bullshit. They, they want long reads, they want slow journalism, they want in-depth. Yes, for sure Italy has not managed to maintain the independence of, uh, of the system, of the media system, but at the same time we have a huge a huge space for uh, for the investigation. We have huge stories too. That's another that's another paradox. I mean, I started as a journalist, you know, working on uh, on, the, on on mafia. I mean, we have the the the, the, the biggest mafia in the world. We have uh, also the sexiest mafia in the world. Everyone is uh, is you know, there's a lot a big huge narration about our 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 terrible mafia. But very often it comes always from uh, from abroad. Why? Why we don't have this other opportunity, this other offer? I think it's uh, there's always a trick. Also, I mentioned before the, the program is very popular here in Italy. It's a uh, no, report that it's the most important program for the national, the national broadcaster. The trick is that they're not they're freelancer actually. They're freelancer who sell their investigation to the public television. We don't have teams, data journalists teams inside newspapers, we don't. We probably are the only country in Europe. Yeah. We don't have an investigative pool inside the public television. And that's the, the big story because investigative journalism, if you have to summarize, I mean, it's time, it's research, okay, risk, and instantly everyone can sue you. It's not like London, it's a bit different. If you don't have a contract with the public television, you are really weak. So you sell, you sell your work to the to, to the to Rai. You're well paid, probably okay, more or less. But then every time you keep going like this, okay, maybe I don't bother too much because next year I want to, you know, I want to be able to sell my new my new work. It's a, the normalization of the system. There is an auto-censorship that is working very, very well in Italy, and nobody talks about that. One of the big problems is that the landscape of um, support and financing of independent and investigative reporting in Italy, it's a disaster. Like, there is no philanthropic culture whatsoever, because it's not possible that doing public interest journalism is not enough. <laughs> I mean, yeah. So, and I think what DIG is, is doing here, it's really worth um, supporting from an international um, philanthropic effort. But even more, once we got that, it would be really great to have Italian donors to support. If you look at uh, the money that is actually running into the digital market for journalism in Italy is ridiculous. It is uh, non-existent, I would say. Yeah. Uh, the budgets are so limited um, to the point that uh, most uh, Italian dailies have adopted uh, a way of doing things from, with journalism online which would make, which would make look the daily mail as a serious newspaper. And uh, this is also uh, a traditional problem that Italian journalists always had. There is no clear distinction between hard news and soft news. If you go on the home page of any major Italian newspaper, you see a combination of things, which is an uh, enormous quantity of political journalism, uh, economics, serious news, and then stuff that you would really find on the daily mail, gossip. It's real. We, we have lots of videos of animals and those kind of things, which is clickbait. And it is impossible for you in the UK to imagine The Guardian doing these things, or The Financial Times, or The New York Times, or, or any serious new paper you can think of. And it's like crazy. I mean, it's, it, it's like you are uh, feeding your problem. And the, there is no easy way out. And luckily, what we saw abroad with new business models for digital journalists is now slowly arriving here with five or six years of delay. The outlets, they don't exist. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's a point. I mean, you, you, can, you can 
deal with with dry, but they 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 don't work a lot on investigation. So, so the thing when I'm when I'm saying normalization, this normalization is much uh, much powerful in Italy because like the big platforms like Netflix and so on, who are really doing something very important and very dangerous on the normalization of the the the, 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 the narrative of journalism. That's my, my, my belief. In Italy, you, you, you really don't get there. I mean, you have Amazon in Italy, for example, and they did a couple of documentaries about sports. They did a documentary on Totti that we, we all know Totti, but you know, maybe there's, there are bigger stories to, <coughs> to work on. So it's, uh, <clears throat> I think, just because I don't want to finish in a, with this like big, big depression, I, I'm really, I'm really, I really think there is, a, there is the possibility to sell your work and to, but you have to be together with some, uh, with some uh, foreigner producer. Um, you have to collaborate with some somebody outside Italy, and that's that's uh, interesting because the lack of uh, of funding is is the is the key point. I mean, in in, in France you have uh, <coughs> you have a CNC, the, the the fund of the national fund that works for the for the cinema and works for the even for uh, for investigation for TV investigation. You know, like France Television has access to the to the national fund. And the national fund is uh, 10 times bigger than the Italian national fund. The national fund in Italy is only for cinema. I did a lot of video, but I'm, the last project was a, was a podcast. And that's another yeah. big topic. I mean, but you know, I did the podcast and I love podcasts, but I did podcast because I had this concept and nobody wanted to, to produce it because it was, uh, and it's an, history investigation. It's about the, 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 the Piazza Fontana massacre, 1969. It didn't happen yesterday, it happened 50 years ago. But everyone was saying, very good concept, very good project, but maybe <coughs> can you take the investigation part away? Or, yes, I like it, but I don't have the money, it's too expensive. So my idea was uh, like a doc series. I worked for a seven months with uh, talking with different different subjects and at the end i said okay let let's do a podcast i think yeah we you're about to close this and i think a good way for doing that is that what we're trying to do with dick is to yeah. bring the world of actual real courageous and brave investigative journalism into the italian public because really i think there is a lack of awareness about real thing and the mission of DIG has always been yeah. that and um, we're really happy and proud to the festival this year and of course to be involved with uh, the Logan Symposium is again a very huge opportunity for us to be seen also outside and uh, um, there is lots of work to do, we can all agree on that and we will play our part I would say. So um, it was really a pleasure. Um, thank you. It was an education, actually, for me. Um, so thank you so much. And uh, enjoy your time at DIG. <laughs>
toți ar fi trei.